all of us, I've been watching end of the year best of lists. I adore them, especially when they are not mostly books published in 2020. Or even if they are mostly published in that year, when they are not like mainstream books. I mean, you can like what you like, but honestly, it gets a little tiring, right? Right? I admit it. Anyways, my point there was that in all of the ones that have been released from the second week of January on, they always have this disclaimer that they are so late and they know that, and I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everybody, I'm Roxy, this is Rick Vias, and today I'm finally talking about my favorite non-fiction books. This list was hard to craft, it was a great reading year, fiction and non-fiction wise actually. I've read some of my new favorites, which is always good. So let's just start. Since I first made the list, a couple of weeks went by and I actually made some changes. So I'm excited to tell you about all the books that I put on this list. I came down to 15. There is no other reason than the fact that 15 was a number that was good for fiction and non-fiction, so I'd like to have the same ones. It also seems like a reasonable number. All of these books I own, but I don't have here, or some of them I might have, I don't know, it's just easier to put pictures. Fun fact, in case you haven't noticed, I always try to put the picture of the edition I have, unless I have an edition in Spanish, and of course I prefer to show the one in English, save certain exceptions. Anyways, let's begin. Number 15 is Sous Chef a book that I read at the beginning of the year, I think it was March, and I absolutely devoured it. It is in second person, which I know a lot of people don't like, but it's basically just what the life of a sous chef is day after day in a kitchen, and it has this 24-hour format, takes you along, and so you are the sous chef, which is something that a lot of people might not like, and a lot of people might not handle it very well, but the author does. I thought it was completely compelling, it was stressful and exhilarating, and I just really felt I was working there and I now know what it is like so I really really enjoyed it if you like cooking memoirs if you like I don't know Anthony Bourdain that sort of high pressure fine dining stuff but without the preciousness I think you are really going to enjoy this number 14 is A Short History of Drunkenness by Mark Forsyth. I haven't stopped thinking about this book even though it's very short it's very light in tone but I am still in awe by the way it crams so much information in a way that it almost reads like a short story. It actually was part of my nonfiction that reads like fiction video, link it down below. And it was just so fun to read, but so much of the information has stayed with me. I've referenced it several times and I just keep thinking about it. I think the humor, the tone, the pace, everything came together. And I know a lot of people like to highlight important books and I completely understand, but I also think there is such value in taking history, especially when it's micro history or history of something very specific, and taking it to broader historical context. It's so hard to do well and Mark Forces does it, so completely recommend this book. The next book is This is Shakespeare by Emma Smith. I absolutely adore this book and I would recommend it to anyone who's a casual Shakespeare fan. Like, they haven't read a lot of studies about it, but they are familiar with his plays and have seen them and have been culturally impacted by them because it's not an absolutely Shakespeare one-on-one. -on -one. It's more of a taking these very well-known and well-studied plays and helping you look at them through a different lens, through other possibilities. She's usually focuses on one thing for each play and she's just so brilliant and once again her tone is so light and approachable but still so informed and knowledgeable and I just love Emma Smith so much. I will link it down below because you have to see it. She has a two-part video with the Penguin platform where she reacts to adaptations of Shakespeare plays and it's Oh, she's so funny. I, if I ever take one of her classes or like just sit in one of her lectures, I am going to be the happiest popper on earth, really. Next is Best American Food Writing 2019. I know, who would have thought? Probably a lot of people. I was just in awe. I think about this collection all the time. Granted, there are essays that carry the collection for me more than others, as always, because it's an anthology, it's not a collection, it's an anthology, so different authors. But I do want to credit Sami Nosrad, who is the editor, and she put together this amazing anthology. I don't think I've read such a good 
best American anthology, even though I usually read the science writing and nature writing ones, and I love them, they are really good, the essay ones as well. But this, it's just so cohesive in a way, even though all of the stories are so different. And so many of the stories, even the ones that I thought wouldn't stay with me as much have stayed with me and so it's amazing i really recommend it even if you're not a big fan of food writing this is not food criticism for the most part but if you're interested in essays in general or like investigative journalism and like hard-hitting journalism i actually really recommend this it has some pieces that are closer to true crime than anything else and there are also some pieces that are much more science writing than anything else and others that are like cultural so just oh so good please check it out then what I believe would be number 13, probably, it's 21 Lessons for the 21st Century by Yuval Noah Harari. I really, really liked this book. It's another one that I really think about often, though now that I'm talking about it, I think I do like Best American Food Writing more. It's just, I love that book so much, <laughs> but I'm still excited about this book. So let's just talk about this book. Basically, it is 21 concepts that Harari feels are the main crossroads, we could say. And he explains how we got here. So it's much more historical than anything else, but he also offers many ways, not solutions, he doesn't offer that. If you're looking for that, you'll be disappointed. But it offers a lot of observations and predictions of how things would go if we behave this or that. It is a feat of research and thinking and the putting together of the things I thought was really clever. It's all so well argued. It felt like very thorough and clear in its rationale. This is a book that I think everyone should read and I think it should be taught at like high schools or colleges because it's just that important. It not only offers the author's views but also a toolkit for having these conversations. The next one I'm really excited to bring back because I mentioned it but I don't know how much I talked about it. It has stayed with me so much and that is China in 10 Words by Yuha. And since the Invisible Cities project has China coming up for February, I will link that down below so you know what I'm talking about. This is my recommendation. I think this is perfect because it's actually quite short. It reads very easily. It's essays but also short stories like it straddles the line but it's basically reflections autobiographical by the author growing up during the revolution and now how China moved from there to a post-capitalist society but it does so through language so that is why China in turn works what I love as you know a linguist by training is that he takes the history and the transformation of the meaning of certain words so for example copycat and revolution and people and he analyzes why their meanings have changed and what does that mean for society and how they reflect society so it's just really good but it's also very light in tone like he has very ironic take on it but he's not cynical which i think is important in this kind of analysis these reflections have stayed so much with me and i feel like i've learned so much about modern china just through this book i think it's really worth your time and i really really recommend it that was china in 10 words by yu hua and i'm going to credit the translator down below because at this time i don't remember it and i don't have the physical book but yeah really really good one now a book that i've already talked too much about so i'm not going to tell you again but bowie's bookshelf by john o'connell what can i say this book i think so much about all the time it's uh, basically an analysis of each of the 100 books that Bowie chose as his essential books and he links it to Bowie's personality but more than that to his work and to his multiple personas and how you see that reflected in his imagery and his music and his concepts so if you love Bowie you cannot miss it if you like literary criticism you might enjoy it but it is mostly about Bowie it does have really good book recommendations and it does provide some context on the books as well so you might wanted for that but we had an amazing literary taste and he traveled with books everywhere which makes me feel very validated not gonna lie <laughs> really love it they also talked about it in my music books video ranked so down below you can check that out the following is Maybe You Should Talk to Someone by Laurie Gottlieb. I read this in February, completely devoured it. Checked it out of the library actually because I was staying with Danny in Seattle at that time and the library had it and I took it out. I just really love using libraries. What can I say about this book? It's memoir about Laurie Gottlieb's 
journey into becoming a therapist, but also her journey with her own therapist and about therapy in general. Lori Goldieff used to work as a screenwriter for TV and she really gets that sense of pace. It's so fabulous how she interweaves these different timelines. I consider them three, general therapy, her journey as a therapist and her journey with her therapist and it will teach you so much about therapy but it's also just such a moving book i cried probably because the subject is personally touching to me but at the same time i have higher expectations so yeah i just adore this book completely recommend it then i have upstream by mary oliver and these are essays on poetry and nature and life you just have to read them i don't know if you like Mary Oliver's poetry or not. Now I do like it, but when I read it, I actually didn't care. I hadn't really read her poems, except like a couple of them. But her insights are so nice and she has such a poetic voice, but it's never too much with her essays. They are actually poetry infused essays and they are never self-indulgent and I just really love it. So if you really like nature writing in particular, you should really check this out. Then I have another music book, Listen to This by Alex Ross. You know I love this book. I talked more about it on my music books ranked video down below, but I'll just say it's a collection of essays the author has written throughout his career about so many different topics, ranging from music snobbery and genre snobbery to classical music and pop music in China, to John Luther Adams, to Bjork, to Radiohead. It's just incredible. Please, please, read it if you like essays and if you like music writing, unmissable, really. Then a book I was so happy to get to this year because I bought it thinking I would read it right away in 2019 and then I didn't. It's Scenes from a Revolution by Mark Harris. This is all about a year, I think it was 19... 67 if I'm not mistaken, but don't quote me on that. The author's argument is that that year was pivotal in Hollywood and like filmmaking because it was such a transitional year and that the films nominated for first picture that year reflect that. And so he takes all of these films from their conception through their making to their award show night and then the aftermath. It's brilliant. Another one of the books that reads like fiction because it is like a character study of these films from birth to adulthood, if you will. If you like film or film studies, once again, an unmissable classic, you need to check it out. The next book I've also talked about recently because it's also featured in my music books and that is Let's Talk About Love by Carl Wilson. Once again, just check out that video. <laughs> if you want to hear more about it, but it's book length essay where he talks about the question of taste and he uses his previous distaste for Celine Dion and specifically for the album Let's Talk About Love to explore what taste is, how it's formed, what does it mean in society and what does it mean as it pertains to music, but also just culture and it's so insightful, so good, but also just fun to read. My only asterisk is that the first part is concerned with Celine Dion in particular, as in her life and career, because what Wilson is doing here is giving himself the task of analyzing Dion's work as he would analyze any other artist work instead of just using his prejudices. So it is a bit, I don't want to read about Celine Dion, but, but it makes sense, I promise. And it's not very long and it, it ties together into this masterpiece of cultural criticism. So please, please read it. Very, very good. Then, <laughs> The Pussy's Paris. I'm sorry. They were some of the best books I read this year and in my entire life, I'm sorry. So this is a look at the Boozy's music through his cultural influences in Belle Epoque Paris. So he talks about the poetry, the imagery, the Orientalism, the nationalism, and he dissects his creations through that. And it's so good, oh my God. It's not light to read, but it's also not 100% academic. It's a really fine line. And this is one that, yes, I don't recommend to everyone, but if you like the boozy and you are interested in literary criticism and are curious about how that would work with music and like cultural criticism, I think you will enjoy this, even if you don't get perhaps the music part. Now, 
if you know about music and you love Debussy like I do, then what are you doing? You need to read this book. It's so amazing. Katrin Kautsky is amazing and I really admire her for putting together this masterpiece and also just in spite of all her information there and all her research, letting her love for Debussy shine and infuse these pages, which I always think is so great. Now number two is the actual objectively best book I read, which is Our Women on the Ground, edited by Zara Hakir. This is a book that I think everyone needs to read. It's an anthology of Arab female reporters writing from the Arab world. They have all been to one extent or another on the ground reporting for different publications. A lot of these essays are originally in English, some others are originally in Arabic, and they are all so good. This is, I think, the first year where I've had two anthologies in my top whatever. I'm still in awe. I think about this book all the time. Whenever someone posts about it. I'm like, yes, you should read this. Yes, this is so good. Yes, this deserves more love because it does. It will open your mind in a way that I feel like we don't even realize and it's something that it's easy to say, yes, of course it's like this, but reading it and reading it through such amazing prose, it's a complete different experience. And what I like is that these are not homogeneous voices. They are women who have suffered and have chosen to retreat. They are women who continue to put up fights. They are women who are much more optimistic, some women that are much more pessimistic, and some of them talk about very personal things and some other talk about broader conflicts. There are a lot of different approaches here to the same thing, which is a question of being a female Arab reporter, but also being just a woman and an Arab woman in the world, but also just being a reporter in the world. It talks a lot about the ethics of journalism. It's just so good. Please read it. It's objectively the best book I read last year. But now I need to tell you my absolute favorite book. And I think you know what it is. And actually I do have this book here. I'm going to go get it. This is So We Read On by Maureen Corrigan, which I read twice last year. This is subtitled How the Great Gatsby Came to Be and Why It Endures. And it's a really, really, really cool book. Really anyone can pick it up and enjoy it so much. About Fitzgerald and him writing The Great Gatsby, about how The Great Gatsby was poorly received at its time, but how then it experienced a revival and now it's one of the most studied books. But it's also a look into The Great Gatsby itself. It analyzes the book in search of clues, in search of the relevance that we still find today for people like me who adore The Great Gatsby and think it's one of the most perfect books ever written. <clears throat> and it's also Corrigan's personal journey with Gatsby, but also as a professor teaching Gatsby in so many different contexts. She's taught adults, college students, she's taught high school kids, and it's so different. She talks about the different angles and all the different interpretations. So it's basically a literature course in a book. And she mentions at the beginning, how she wrote this because she's always wanted to teach a whole class just on the great Gatsby as some people do with you know Proust Swan's Way or James Joyce's Ulysses but she's never been allowed because the great Gatsby is such a short novel but to her it is the great American novel and it really is like a course I know I keep saying that but it's true so if you've never taken a literature class whatever your feelings on the great Gatsby are if you haven't read it then you'll probably get spoiled, so read it first. But if you've read it once and you don't feel like rereading it, that's okay. You can just read this. It takes the text as well. And it shows you what a great literature class does, which is, you know, provide context, but also provide close reading and provide just a sense of excitement about the book. And also just the ability to dissent. Like you don't have to agree with everything Corrigan says, but she shows you what you do when you study literature. And a lot of people don't like that approach to literature, but you know, as a literature major, I just love it. This book changed my life and I kept saying this and I will tell you why. I read this in February, which was a time where I was very confused about what I was going to do after college. I graduated, not last year, so 2019, and I had a plan. I realized that I hated that plan and that I had been coerced into that plan. So I kind of changed gears, but even when I changed gears, I wasn't sure what path to follow. I read this and I said, that is what I want to do with my life. This 
is a book that I would love to write. Not necessarily on The Great Gatsby, of course, but just this is what I want to do. I want to talk about books and extend the love of books and the reach of books. It is a very naive position, especially now that the world is on fire, but since the world is on fire, why not take the opportunity to do what you love, right? And I decided I was going to go into a master's in literature, which I wasn't able to start because of this thing, but hopefully this will be the year. Please keep your fingers crossed for me. And that is how this book changed my life. It literally changed my career path. Before then, I was going to study something else, which is not completely unrelated, but I wasn't going to go into literature masters and literature research. And actually, when I started my program at my university, I also thought I was going to be doing something else when I finished. And as I said, I had this whole thing planned out and this completely shook all of that up, but I have no regrets. Regardless of that, I read it again in December to see if it had just been the excitement, but no, this is actually excellent. So if you're interested, please check it out because it's really, really good. So that's it. If you like this video, please give a thumbs up, please subscribe and comment. Have you read any of these books or do you want to read any of these books after having Listen to me ramble on about them. I try to be as succinct as possible. And it's hard with your favorite books of the year because you love them so much. You just could go on and on. Or maybe that's just me. Remember to listen to the Bibliophile Daily. I made a card website with all the links so you don't need to visit the video every single time. So if you want to check that out, it is my daily podcast of literary facts. Also, all my social media is linked down below and all the books that I mentioned and all the media that I mentioned, all down below. See you next time.